How are you guys doing? Great, great. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here. And uh, I hope that uh, you have an amazing day. It's a great show for everyone. And um, let me introduce Adam Chesterton, Director of Engineering at the Warrior Music Group. And I'm Renat Kasanshan uh, with Altoros. And today we're going to share with you a journey that Adam, myself, and our teams, some of you are here, thank you very much, we shared together. And uh, these lessons learned, we would love to, um, to share with you. So thank you very much. And Adam, please. Brilliant. Thank you, Arnold. Yeah, so um, basically we're going to talk today about Warner Music's group's um, recent path over the last 12 months. A few things have changed um, based on our cloud sort of strategy, and we sort of came and adopted the public cloud. So that's why I'm here to talk to you today um, about. So to get started, and I, what I want to do is actually cast back 12 months from where we are today. So from WMG's point, we were very early adopters of Cloud Foundry. Uh, we've essentially been using it since uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, we were at a point that we were like three years mature. Um, we're using the community version. Um, and I think we're still one of the largest organizations using the community version for production workloads today. So um, basically, um, going about that 12 months. So we basically, we, we were using multiple cloud providers, some private, some public. We actually had a total of five different providers we were using. And by this point, we had multiple business applications which were running on the platform um, using actual business um, sensitive workloads. But then something happened and we sort of hit that sort of moment where we were in a really, really crowded sort of space. Um, we were, rather than using multi-cloud in terms of providers, we sort of had like this hybrid cloud environmental sort of approach. Um, and the question we sort of asked ourselves is, were we using the cloud in the right way? So we technically had our lower environments, uh, development and QA and testing in the public cloud. And then in the private cloud, we had our staging production um, type environments across multiple different providers. So we had actually managed to crack the way to rapidly build, test, deploy code into Cloud Foundry. Um, but then we actually started to experience some other issues, and I'll let Renault talk about a few of those. Yeah, great. So uh, when uh, we first started uh, getting the workloads uh, to OpenStack, uh, based environment, which was with a uh, managed uh, OpenStack provider, uh, we suddenly realized that the environment is not as reliable as, as we uh, hoped uh, it would be. And one of the biggest issues we, uh, we faced early on was uh, the inconsistency of the OpenStack API when it comes to uh, giving the Bosch the virtual machines, the pool of resources to later then deploy the Cloud Foundry or even some of the Bosch components. So um, uh, sometimes we would uh, request, let's say, 10 VMs. Most of the time we'd get all 10, but sometimes we'd get two or nothing at all. So you would be wondering, like, what's going on? So we try to uh, get the answer ourselves. And unfortunately, the, the everyone in that game, it was back in 2013, early 14 when we started uh, getting this environment uh, stood up um, with the OpenStack provider. Um, everyone of you knows who, if you deal, dealt with OpenStack, um, it came a long way when it comes to maturity. So back in 2013, you can figure out how big a maturity of it was. So we were having issues with the um, environment just like pretty much everybody else. And um, unfortunately, because the, we hoped that the managed provider would uh, take care uh, of that uh, problem themselves, but it seems like no one had access to the proper logs. Uh, ask them, everybody, right? So we all were confused. <laughs> and uh, we had to stand up the environment quickly. So uh, because of the uncertainty, uh, uh, when it comes to getting those VMs uh, from, from OpenStack, we faced those issues uh, early on. Um, uh, then, um, 
when we were actually able to get uh, the, the environment up and running, we would provision uh, Bosch first, and we would provision the, the uh, Cloud Foundry with, with Bosch, and uh, everything seems perfect until uh, we would get the timeouts. Unexpectedly, out of nowhere, and uh, uh, the, the problem was not just as much as, oh yeah, we get a timeout. Well, stuff happens, right? Uh, the problem was that uh, if you go back to what Adam said, that remember we were coming from just the AWS only environment, and for uh, for us the OpenStack, the, these two regions that we were going into OpenStack, uh, they were supposed to be the, the production, the staging and production environments where the developers supposed to be using the the, the dev test environment in AWS, and then we would uh, bring the applications from AWS into staging and then production. The key problem that uh, we had is that this, these errors, that apparently the reason why we had those errors, uh, the, 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 these timeouts, it, was, uh, it, had to, uh, it had to do with the OpenStack itself. It was a common issue that many uh, operators of OpenStack at the time faced. Uh, ultimately, it was fixed by just uh, with the next release of OpenStack. And uh, instead of trying to like patch it, right? Well, it was patched first, but then the next release came out, uh, issues disappeared. The key problem we had was not, not the fact that we had issues. You always have them. The problem we uh, experienced was that we could not get consistent results. We, we, we were not testing the same thing because we, we, we thought Cloud Foundry would give us, oh, like environments are now the same. We can go from one cloud to another. The reality was a little bit different. So. Uh, all these outside factors contributed to one uh, key point where we could not guarantee a certain time of the week or day or in the future where we would actually be ready for production deployment. So all of these issues were ultimately resulted in the situations where we're like, hey guys, we can probably do it, but we cannot promise anything. <laughs> so. And that's what happened where uh, uh, the end, of, end, end users, those business uh, um, line, lines of business, those developer groups that were bringing their applications and expected to have a reliable environment that they could go with production with, they were like, what's going on, guys? Can you really give us something? Can you promise anything? And with those completely unreliable, uh, unpredictable situations, we could not promise everything, and then obviously it wasn't good. So. Cool, thank you. So yeah, so we basically, we did a big pause and a big sort of a reset and sort of took a look at the sort of the strategy we had. Um, as Renaud was sort of saying, it was becoming hard to predict the unknown. This whole hybrid environment cloud um, situation we were sort of in was basically impacting as we were sort of setting out deadlines for business and for new applications and for new projects that we were onboarding onto Cloud Foundry. So do you take that sort of that area where you become overcautious in terms of your deliverables, which really goes away against the, the, the power of what Cloud Foundry can do in terms of rapid deployment? We, or do you basically take a risk and think, hey, you know what, it may be smooth, it may not be, and then you, you come into a very sticky situation with business stakeholders. So we actually um, found it wasn't code or anything that was causing us problems, it was these external factors. And, Look, at this, play, at this point, we basically had a platform that was three years mature, and these sorts of things we shouldn't really be having. Um, we would talk with our vendors. Um, I mentioned we were using five. Um, every time we would have one of these sorts of issues, and the recommendation that kept coming back to us as we did the post-mortems was, look, you guys need to go one way or the other. It's, and we basically didn't really have a compelling reason to stay with the model that we did. So we took this pause and a reset and sort of think about our strategy that we had. And then looking back over the last three years, as we grew and as we expanded our actual Cloud Foundry presence within Warner Music, we actually re we took a look out and saw how much the public cloud had actually evolved and adapted. Things such as like in terms of security, reliability, um, one of the, the things, and, and WMG has came to this conference multiple times and spoken about our cloud vision. And one of the things that, the reason we built the platform that we did was we expected 
the price of compute and disk space to decrease over time. And with the, with the price wars between the multiple public um, cloud providers, that's exactly what happened. But one thing we did start to see was the reliability side of the public cloud actually started to increase. And because we had this hybrid cloud um, environment, we started seeing from our lower environments have very similar, um, if not comparable, uptime to our managed private cloud um, providers, which going back three or four years was just not the case. Um, so we basically went and we did a comparison. You want to talk through some of the yeah. stuff we did, Ronald? Yeah, so um, uh, first of all, the, the challenges that we had were not just uh, what you just described. Remember, we were talking back about like this whole story started in 2013, right? When just like, how many of you guys, actually I have a question, how many of you attended the 2013 event right here in, uh, in, in this very building? The first cloud foundry. So, any? Oh, yeah, quite a few. Uh, so, if you remember, uh, we had uh, one of the great early visionaries and uh, evangelists of cloud foundry, Jonathan Murray of Warner Music Group. Right? Uh, he was very passionate about making cloud foundry uh, work to make the composable enterprise and and and, and get the agility into an organization. Uh, so, we faced. Uh, not just issues we were, we were talking about with OpenStack. We also were coming off from Cloud Foundry 1.0. And we had like, a, we, we had a bunch of uh, components that were customized, like a cheap proxy router. And it was like a, a bunch of stuff, like it became a, s a snowball. So, uh, and, th and then add five, six cloud providers to it. Uh, you have mo many more problems than you have hands. So <laughs> uh, we were in the situation where we uh, wanted to simplify the, uh, the, the, the risk areas, kind of our uh, risk profile. Um, uh, and, and that's why uh, coming back to uh, an environment that would be reliable, that would allow us, the team responsible for Cloud Foundry, to, to promise to the business user that, yes, that is the date. And, and stay, stay behind it. And that was uh, one of the key uh, benefits that we were seeking, the reliability and be able to stay true to our promises. So uh, with, uh, w with the public cloud, I'll mm -hmm. take that. So no, we, we, we sat back, we looked, we looked, we did the comparisons, we did the sort of thing, we took all of this on board, and we came to the conclusion that we wanted to go public cloud all the way. And that was not as simple as what we thought. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, we already had infrastructure there, um, but we didn't really want to just take what we had in the public cloud and just move it straight into sort of the exact same model that we had. Um, we're three years mature at this point, and we wanted to take advantage of some of the changes and enhancements that's happened within the public cloud. So what did we do next? Um, we actually went out and we wanted to, we spoke with AWS architects and talked about ways how we could take advantage of things like VPCs, ELBs, direct connects, multi-availability zones, and how we could actually provide a model for all of our environments and basically look to rebuild everything from scratch. So automation for us was actually extremely important. So we worked, um, worked very hard to actually get things like CloudFormation, uh, to build out a sort of a foundation of Cloud Foundry and then basically using Bosch on top of that in order to deploy the applications and do that across all of the environments that we had. Um, security was, of course, a really, really big factor and there's been so much enhancements in the security sort of remit on the public cloud over the last few years. So we got a, a bunch of our colleagues went to reInvent last year with the purpose of actually trying to find partners to help us with this challenge. And I think one of the things that sort of came out that's very clear, there are a lot of people in this space. This is a real problem out there in terms of people need help in terms of like, if I take something on my own and go down the public cloud route, I, I need help. If I go to a managed service, I, I get all that as part of the, the cost that I get. So it's a popular trend, um, and we basically went and listened, um, aligned ourselves with the right partner that we needed that fitted the business and operating model that we had. 
Um, also, another thing that was very important to us was actually the upgrade path of Cloud Foundry. Um, we're very excited about Diego. We wanted to move to that and actually building up resiliency within Cloud Foundry, which was something we really had to do to move into this multi-availability zone um, model. Um, we wanted to make sure that we actually had a path that we could stay in line with upgrades and take advantage of some of the great stuff that's coming up. So this whole entire project kicked off um, around uh, the beginning of last summer, and we actually fully completed it in February this year. So a couple of the lessons learned. Yeah. You take the first so, one. Yeah. Um, uh, well, first of all, being able to promise to the lines of businesses when they can get their applications uh, into the environments and what kind of service levels that they can expect is of a gigantic advantage if you are operating with uh, multiple uh, uh, consumers. Uh, and, and the price that, uh, as a result, we were willing to pay for having that, uh, that expectations on availability, on reliability of what we can promise, is actually was much higher that we were willing to pay in the, the result, yeah. right? Initially we thought, oh, we're gonna club funding and take care of it, but it wasn't the case. So uh, uh, controlling costs uh, was um, uh, also an issue. Uh, Adam, we're gonna speak on this, but I can just add a little bit that we are uh, not gonna stop here. Uh, we're also looking into some very seemingly cool ways to control costs when it comes to public cloud. Uh, we even go all the way to even look at the, uh, the, uh, the spot instances, how we can use them for some of the DA work. And, and But now, uh, back to Adam for yeah. the cost, what we actually did. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, like, cost is, of course, very important. Like, coming from a music company, the music industry is just not what it was 10, 20, 30 plus years ago. So, Cost is actually a really important factor to us because every dollar we're spending is a dollar we're not spending on artists a and R, finding new artists, marketing, um, and we have a commitment back to the company to make sure that we're spending the company's money um, in the right way. So uh, one of the things we learned, especially during the migration, something we really, really factored in place was when you're spinning up new environments, you're going to run for a period of time of parallel infrastructure up there. And in terms of really excellent planning and testing, um, we actually minimized the amount of time that we had both environments up. We, we had them up, we had the ability to test, spun things down, spun things back up, and it allowed us to really manage our costs so that we weren't running with basically two production environments for a considerable amount of time. And also we've talked a lot, especially after the migration, in terms of utilizing things such as reserved instances. And for those services and, um, that are basically up 24 by seven, um, five, seven days a week, is a case of like um, taking the reserved instance approach helps us to easily save 40 to 60% based on on-demand pricing. But one of the beauties of, of both Cloud Foundry and using the AWS um, um, economics is a case of, I can basically have all my DEAs as reserved instances. And if I need more capacity, I can spin um, another DEA up very, very quickly. On demand, I'm not committed, I'm paying as I go. But if I find I don't need to recover that um, capacity, if actually it's a case of I do need to add, as I'm onboarding more applications, if I'm finding in the long term I do need this capacity, I can just convert that immediately to reserved instance pricing and I get those benefits. I, it's from, from an accounting thing, it, it means that we can be very creative and actually make sure that we're, we're spending money well. So from a WMG perspective, this whole initiative that we had, and it was a good nine months sort of initiative, was what was the immediate benefits back? And for us, one of the big things is we actually accomplished what we actually wanted to do. Um, by moving solely into the public cloud, we've actually removed this, this whole random unknowns that kept happening. It actually means that when we're talking with the business and setting expectations, we can be significantly more, more accurate. Um, one of the best lessons learned is that from the actual entire project as well is we actually migrated with absolutely no disruption to the business users or applications. It was extremely transparent to them. 
And that was mainly down to the planning, the testing, the UAT, and actually testing the migration multiple times before we actually performed it. So we didn't disrupt uh, SLAs or anything uh, around those sorts of things. And for the end users, performance is, is the same. We, we have the, all the metrics. We've done all that sort of testing in place. And in some ways, the SLA is actually improved because we can now give better commitments. So when um, business users come to us and want functionality, we've got a much better sense of the whole end-to-end -end of what happens. So elasticity. A few lessons we learned on the elasticity end is that uh, apparently public cloud is not as elastic as you may think it is. So uh, what we experienced is that when, if let's say you need X number of instances of a certain type, uh, things like, it may seem like AWS is like infinite pool of resources, but when you cannot get them, you're like, what's going on? And the reality is that uh, it's not as elastic as you may think. It is because um, if you are using instances of a certain type um, and you need a lot of them, uh, sometimes you may need to talk to folks at AWS to make sure it's there if it's, or it's going to be there, pre-reserved and so on and so forth. And uh, what we learn is that if your workloads are not uh, subject to extreme spikes, um, sometimes the elasticity you get in the managed private cloud that's managed by the vendor, it may be as elastic as you want, right? And uh, so uh, unless you, you are flexible in terms of the types of instances you're using, uh, keep, keep that in mind. And um, um, uh, overall, we, 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 we find it really great to uh, work with uh, a public cloud provider uh, such as AWS. However, uh, what we find is that um, some of the services that uh, uh, might be, some of the services look extremely tempting to end users. And uh, they start looking at them, and what we learn is that sometimes they're not production grade because they might be very new. So, uh, what I wanted to, uh, maybe Adam, can you sure, uh, absolutely. comment on this? Sure, I mean, a couple of examples that we sort of have here, especially around the elasticity, especially if you don't have reserved instances. When you're in the, the private clouds, you can have as much elasticity as you pay for. In the public cloud, one of the things that we learned very quickly was, and especially as you start talking about things like spot instances and other things, if you're buying on demand and you have a very specific instance type that you're after, you, you, it, the, you cannot guarantee that that is always going to be there. AWS may come around to you and say, hey, I do not have it in this region, but I could throw you it somewhere else. So I guess one thing for the sort of future as you're building applications and going down that sort of model um, in terms of trying to be flexible in terms of the instance types you're using. And if you do need a guarantee, if you have a process that you run every night and you need X amount, you build the applications to either scale based on the instance type and size that you get back. Yep. So. Yeah, and uh, um, for those of you who would like to dig much deeper into the details and get some of the lessons learned that you can take home, uh, we have prepared a hangout. Uh, can we get a few copies right there and uh, I'll actually help uh, distribute them. So we put together uh, a lot of resources here. Uh, essentially, it's a reference architecture uh, for uh, something as simple as uh, East and West uh, AWS uh, regions and you have Clafano in each. We have um, um, the, the patterns and the anti-patterns, the five of each, five patterns and five anti-patterns. And we also prepared a list of uh, what it seems like uh, 10 tips in uh, several categories that solve uh, 10 different problems and there are 10 suggested solutions. So uh, we hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, um, uh, reading about uh, this and if, you, if, if some of you may use it um, uh, in your real work, we'll be extremely happy. Uh, to, to help some of you and uh, uh, pass around the knowledge. And overall, uh, thank you very much for uh, using Cloud Foundry because all together we're very strong and uh, hopefully we will have uh, many more case studies in the, in the coming years on different use cases of Cloud Foundry. Great, and thank you. And um, with that, um, we'll turn it over to any questions anyone may have or...
do you feel confident that if you decided to move from AWS to Azure to wherever, that you'd be able to do that? And what kind of time frame do you think that you'd be up against? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really, really great um, question. So as I sort of, I've sensed that essentially over the course of the last few years, there's been rapid change across all of the public clouds. So I, I didn't want to specifically name ones. We're using AWS at the moment. I think what's clear between Google and Azure is that there's a lot of competition and they're trying to keep um, level. That's helping on price, but the, it's also comparable. And so you take something like Azure, which has very much adopted Cloud Foundry there as well. With um, running on the AWS model, we did have to spend a lot of time working with CloudFormation and the AWS tool sets. And the, the sort of thing I would sort of look at is it's a case of like, there's lots of options out there. So if we wanted to go down um, that sort of path, we absolutely could. I, th I think it's sort of the same sort of challenges that I put on the learning things around security is probably still one of the, the biggest sort of areas. And they do things slightly different and have different terms, but um, we could take the model and move there if we so wished. So, yeah, One of the tips in the um, operating tips in public-private clouds, in fact, is... Uh, uh, is uh, number uh, number nine, which is uh, provision with uh, infrastructure as a service native service. So we we prepared the environments uh, in AWS with uh, cloud formation, so that and it seems to become like a like a normal practice nowadays compared to just a couple of years ago, where you would uh, try to use Bosch for that, right? And so now we kind of prepare the environments and then Bosch goes to work, right? So that's tip number nine. And uh, uh, the ch my, I would add to this is that uh, the, um, uh, the differences in the, uh, not just uh, performance, but also the, the, uh, the, some of the like storage service, uh, uh, object store, like you may have some dependencies that not necessarily in the Cloud Foundry space, but uh, where you may wanna uh, cross check what do you use and this what we experienced is that it's very tempting for some developer teams to start using a new service from AWS. Adam, you, you said uh, yeah. the other day that uh, but, but it wasn't ready. Do you remember what was Yeah, we, so we had a situation coming out of reInvent this year. So one of the great things about AWS is they have lots of native services. And um, I talk a lot with the account teams that we have there. And as a developer, you, you sort of get like stuff when it's ready to rock and roll. Uh, maybe not as ready for prime time as we perhaps had. So one example coming out of reInvent was around schema migrations. Um, and essentially, we had a developer who basically, they announced this feature that you could basically import database schemas from Oracle into Postgres. Um, developer went, he tried it out instantly ran into a, to a problem. So he's there Googling and everything looking around and then sort of came to and came up and was like, this is really strange, I can't find anything. And actually the, the, the I went to him and was like, yeah, you do know that this was only like, like 12 hours ago, no one knew that this thing existed. <laughs> so there, there is a notion like you can be early adopters with AWS and I think especially with the native services, um, you, as a developer you absolutely should. Um, one of the things I've talked about internally at Warner is you look at things like Lambda from when it was announced, um, what, just over 18 months ago, to, to what they were actually announcing in terms of feature sets at reInvent last year. So, um, and there's definitely um, something we, we're looking at. So, um, but you've got to resist the temptation to just dive straight in, I think. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Just say, just say, just one more time. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, it was it was one of the things we looked at, especially as we were sort of as we were sort of going down the path and looking at the public cloud. Now we had experience of building it ourselves, 
And at the time, we were very comfortable. And I think like some of the tool sets that things like Microsoft have put in place with Azure that got announced recently will definitely help in that area. And we're lucky because we've used a lot of support from Autorus to sort of help us. So at the moment, we've always been, um, we've felt capable in-house of dealing with that. Um, but I think it's really great of the, the adoption and the tool sets out there to, to make it much easier for people. So it, it was one of the things that we looked at, but that wasn't one of the individual problems that we had, but it's a real problem out there. Thank you. So I noticed in your reference architecture that you just handed out that you have like an example of like US East and US West, and it says in there two separate Cloud Foundry deployments. What's the developer experience like to deploy to those, is that a single, like is that handled as a single CF push or is that two targeted CF pushes and how does that work? So what, what we have at the moment, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the architecture, which is sort of an example of the, the sort of path that we're, we're sort of going to. Um, the answer is yes, we, we essentially at the moment is highly around multiple availability zones with a multiple regions coming later. Um, but it's been the sort of model that we've been thinking about. It's like, what's that sort of scenario, two scenarios that you sort of pick out. One is, what happens if I lose an entire availability center and potentially half my infrastructure? Um, in terms of making sure that the platform itself doesn't start doing crazy things about spinning up lots of things and being unsure what's happening. Um, in terms of the deployment, um, though, between the model that we sort of have is it would be the single push and, and go out there. That's the model that we're, we're working through at the moment. So, thank you. Any other thank questions? You. Brilliant. Thank you All very right, much, mate. guys. Thanks, guys.